Welcome back everybody, I hope you enjoyed your respective breakout sessions. Um, we've got a pretty interesting afternoon ahead and as I mentioned we're going to get into some of those quick fire presentations that are just 15 minutes each which is hopefully going to get us through that mid-afternoon lull. But before we get to that uh, we are going to be hearing from a guest who during the financial crisis it would be fair to say gained a bit of a reputation as New Zealand's answer to Nouriel Roubini or Dr Doom as he's sometimes known but uh, more often not than not he was also right. Um, he's also predicted the demise of some of our regional centres which I understand means he's no longer welcome in Whanganui. Um, but I understand the book has been very popular, growing apart as into its second print. So very well done on that. Um, yeah. And also Steve this morning called him the poster boy of the NZIER, and I'm sure he'd be uh, willing to take on that label. So please give him a warm welcome, the Principal Economist of the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research, Shamabil Yaakob. Thanks very much for the warm welcome. So, Steve set me the impossible task of being interesting as an economist at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so what can I do? So I've come with my standard package and see what you guys think. So I guess, um, you know, because I'm a New Zealand economist, I'm going to tell you the story from a very New Zealand perspective, but I believe the messages are much wider and there's some massive implications and opportunities for us right through the Asia Pacific region. And I hope that sort of lays us into or sets us up for the upcoming sessions in the afternoon. And I guess the thing, the thing that I really want to get across were really around these kind of themes. I believe payments is, is a critical part of the infrastructure of the economy. And I remember sort of thinking about this uh, when we did some very in-depth uh, research for the internet in terms of how does it work. And when you kind of lay, peel back all the layers, what you find is that the whole point of something like the internet and about the payment system is that you don't notice it. It should be so good that you shouldn't even notice it. And I guess that's one of the ways that I think about of the, of the infrastructure that uh, glues our economy together, particularly one that's changing so rapidly. You know, I see massive amounts of opportunity in the payment system, but also in the increasing change in the technology we're seeing in our payments and our economy more generally. But at the same time, we know there are some big changes ahead which will pose some risks to what we do now, but also create opportunities where we're going ahead. Um, the first one, of course, is the technological change. You've heard about it from uh, other speakers today. Um, the other thing is going to be around aging. We're going to see entirely different customers, both in our own markets and in other markets that are coming through. And the final trend that's going to come through, which I guess is probably the most important one, is the emerging uh, re-emergence re of the Asia-Pacific region. So the economic powerhouses of the Asia-Pacific region are going to throw open so many opportunities. And because in many cases they are starting from a much lower basis, we are going to see significant changes in a very short period of time. So I guess in terms of the backdrop, what are we thinking about? What, am I, what do I think about as an economist when it comes to payments? Now payments, uh, you know, probably like economists, doesn't sound like a particularly sexy thing. Now the wrong room to say that in, right? But <laughs> When I sort of thought about what it means, and you know, it was really sort of when you try to break it down into the bits that, that it matters within the economic context, the first thing, the biggest part is it reduces transaction costs. And you, know, you guys know this stuff, but this is so critical. In so many parts of the world, this is absolutely not what happens. Cost of doing business is really high, and transactions are very difficult to do. And even though we take it for granted, and many people in many places take it for granted, that is absolutely not the case in many places. And by being able to join up with each other through a big payments network, what we have is breaking down, down of the barriers, being able to bring people together, communities together, and that gives you benefits of network. And the reason we talk about this is in places like New Zealand, we are so small. Four and a half million people is literally a village in most countries, right? And for that, having that scale benefits through a network of whatever kind gives you an advantage that a lot of other places don't. And that allows innovation in the economy. And ultimately, when we talk about anything, what are we talking about when we talk about economic prosperity? We want to have as much enabling infrastructure that is going to create economic prosperity. And payment system, internet, all of those kinds of infrastructure fits very neatly into the critical infrastructure that's absolutely important for innovation, not only within the particular sector, but by allowing innovation in other parts of the economy. And one of the things that I always sort of marvel at is the changes that we're seeing in the economy. In the video that was playing just as we were coming back about how many people are using direct debits and other ways of paying, uh, paying off their um, bills. And, you know, I literally do not carry any cash. I cannot remember the last time I had coins. I hate them. They're so annoying, right? 
No? Am I the only one? And apparently, I'm not the only one, because if you look at how people are buying their retail products, uh, and it used to be over 50%, around 50% of sales go, being purchased with cash, that's now being purchased with um, less than 35% uh, less than now being purchased with cash. And this is changing all the time. And once we add in things like internet sales, the impact is much, much bigger. And we are seeing these changes come through, not just with people like me in my age group, but also older people. My parents, they do everything on AP now and direct debit. They don't want to deal with the whole thing of writing of the checks and whatnot. I mean, who has a checkbook anymore? Anybody? We'll come and talk to you later. <laughs> For me, the outlook in terms of the payment side is there is this amazing opportunities that are there in a lot of countries where I think this is a real barrier to economic growth, where we don't have the right infrastructure to be able to transact freely, to be able to connect with each other freely. The connections, the interconnections that we have between and within our countries are not as strong as they could be. And, you know, this is, I'm an economist, so I'm going to show lots of scatter plots that's going to require many, many minutes to explain. But, you know, that's what happens when you're a geek and you love charts. The thing about the, the, the payment side and the way the transactions happen in the economy is that they're still done very differently in different parts of the world. And I guess our particular focus here is the Asia Pacific region, which is highlighted in the orange dots. And across the bottom is income per capita, and across the top, across the vertical scale, is uh, essentially uh, money supplied relative to GDP. What you'll see there is that for a lot of the Asia Pacific countries, there is very little sort of turnover of money, and their incomes are very low. They're sort of clustered in that bottom left corner. And that might let you make you go and think that, well, maybe there are not many opportunities when it comes to the payment side of things, because it's still very much a cash-based economy, still very archaic in the way that we used to do things maybe 20 or 30 years ago. But the thing is, when I look at other things, other indicators like what's happening in terms of the uptake of things like cellular phones, and you see the, that myth is completely busted. In the technology uptake that we're seeing in the Asia Pacific region, particularly in low income countries, is massive. And it's really, really massive. And that tells us that even though the income's not there, the real critical thing here is that the uptake of technology is really massive. And payments is exactly that. You are able to get into a space where people are dying for new ways of doing things that reduces the transaction cost. So I come from Bangladesh, right? And you know, one of the th big things that they have done there is with the microfinance program with Grameen. But the other thing that they've done with Grameen is providing cell phones to people in the villages. And the difference that has made is has reduced the information asymmetry that exists between people who live in the provinces, in the rural centers, and people in towns. So in the past, you wouldn't know what the price of vegetables was, or the price of fish, or the price of grain. But now, you can go, what's the price? And nobody gets ripped off, well, not so much anymore, because of that ability to connect and use technology much better. But payment systems in places of Bangladesh are still abysmal, where we've got massive, massive frictions and massive costs of doing business in places like that. But I believe that what we're seeing in this sp space of technology with an example like technology of cellular phones, the uptake of it is that this, there is this massive appetite, this massive appetite and this ability to already leapfrog some of the existing infrastructure that we might have used in places like New Zealand that you, just, you don't have to use and you can go into um, in terms of implementing payments in the uh, opportunities we have in Asia and the Pacific. Um, this is something that I show all the time, but I think this is really critical in terms of where we're going and why we need to think about how quickly we have to move and how these opportunities are going to come forward. Um, this, I saw this chart in the uh, New York Times uh, about five or six years ago, and you know, I, I, it just so it beautifully illustrates the power of technology and how it's changing the way that we live. The landline took 50 years to reach mass penetration. Um, the home computer, 17, the internet, 13, and the smartphone, 7. And you know, it's, it's, it's such a great story how every new technology is coming through much, much quicker. And it means that the shelf life of every technology is getting shorter. But also the changes within these markets is really, really massive. Um, I used to ask people how many people have smartphones. Now I have to ask how many people don't have smartphones. I'll ask that. How many people don't have smartphones? One guy. You have far too much dark hair not to have a smartphone, man. Come on. <laughs> really? How many people have Blackberries? Oh, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you 
So at BlackBerry, you know, that's a story of the rise and fall that's really massive, right? I mean, 2008 market cap was $80 billion. Today it's less than $4 billion. So the shelf life of technology, the rise and fall of technology is so fast. Not only are we seeing new technologies coming through, but the shelf life of technologies within those sectors is really fast. So we are seeing this incredibly high rate and rapid pace of innovation, which is really exciting. But that's something that we have to see in the payment sector as well, and we will see in the payment sector, because no one is immune. And this means that we can either try and be defensive, try and protect what we have, or we open up and we try and change and take advantage of the opportunities that are coming. The other aspect, of course, is this, with this accelerating change of technology, we're seeing this massive opening up of economic potential right around the world. And you know, the, the, what we're seeing in terms of the economic rise in places like Asia and even in the parts of the Pacific is very much around the technology reducing the barriers of distance and scale. The other aspect that's coming through in a very big way is you know, one of the things that we face right around the advanced world mainly is this issue of aging population. So I use the New Zealand example here because I think um, it's easy for us to relate to. But if you look at what's happening in places like New Zealand and many of the advanced economies, the fastest growing age group is the over 65s. All of a sudden, what we've got is a bunch of people who are probably less able to take advantage of technological change. And what we're seeing on the flip side, in, particularly in Asia and the Pacific, is this incredibly large young population that's still growing they still become educated, they're still urbanizing. We're seeing these massive changes. The opportunities of the future are going to be in completely different markets to where they were in the past. And this massive change means that we've got some risks because what we understand in terms of markets that are common, markets that are accepted today, are different from the ones that will be the opportunities of the future. And the other thing that comes through, I mean, this, this, this chart that I saw from the Brookings Institution was just mind-blowing. Mind-blowing because when you look at the growth in middle-class population, I forgot to say this was in the next 25 years, you'll see that there is only one market where there is an opportunity. This is the growth in middle-class households. If you had to pick a market to really go into, where would you go? Has to be Asia-Pacific. It's a no-brainer. This is the only place that is going to create massive, massive amounts of wealth, massive amounts of opportunity, new markets, new preferences. It is going to be so exciting, and it is going to be so different from everything that we have known in the past. And I guess a lot of the stories that we talk about in terms of the, uh, the changes of the global economy is really around this, this shift in the center of the, uh, the global, global economy. And you know, this, is, this is a chart that I saw in the McKinsey Global Institute quite some time ago, but I think this captures it so beautifully. AD1, the center of the global economy, is on the Silk Route. By the 1950s and 60s, it has shifted out towards the Atlantic as the European countries and America have become economic superpowers. But since then, it has actually been drifting back east. This is really, really interesting stuff because what we are now seeing is the weight of population, the weight of youthful populations, the education of Asia, the education of the Pacific, the rise of urbanization and technology uptake is shifting the global economy back towards the East. This is a massive, massive story because this is something that we've been hearing about, but I don't think we still understand how important, how big it is for all of us. For New Zealand in particular, this is a massive opportunity. This is the first time the global economy is coming towards us. This is so exciting. When you're a small country in the middle of nowhere, distance really, really matters. And in, this is the first time we're going to get this massive market open and opening up very much on our doorstep. But this speaks to many, many things. And one of them, of course, is the formal connections that we have with these countries, the harmonization that we have in terms of our systems, our processes, and our ability to engage. I'll give you one example of an area where we're making so little progress. With China, we have an FTA. We were the first ones to do one, and that has paid us massive dividends, right? So you know, this is the statistic that always scares a lot of people. In the last five years, our exports have grown by $5 billion. Our exports to China have grown by $7.4 billion. Did you get that? Without China, we would have gone backwards. How many people do you think study Mandarin relative to Spanish? about half as many kids study Mandarin as Spanish. There is nothing wrong with Spanish, it's a lovely language. They're just not buying your stuff, right? 
So in, when we're thinking about taking advantage of economic opportunities, we need to go beyond. We need to go beyond the formal systems, the formal processes. We need to think about how are we going to engage and connect with this growing world that is so different, so different from what we do in New Zealand or Australia or any of these markets today. And one of the conversations that I have with my foreign trade colleagues in particular is this story around, you know what is happening in terms of our economy? We keep on looking at these indicators like how, how easy it is to do business in places like New Zealand. And we go, isn't that wonderful? The thing is, yes, it is. But the people we want to do business with, man, they're hard to do business with. You know, I was telling you about Bangladesh. It's one of the most difficult places in the, do, in the world to do business in. And yet, when I was at Goldman Sachs, one of the bits of work we did showed very clearly that the next 11, the opportunities that are coming after the BRIC economies, are going to be in countries that are corrupt and have dis despot political parties. So we are going to have these massive opportunities in places that are so hard to do business in. And we have to think about how can we overcome these gaps and barriers because that's where the opportunities are. And in many cases, the opportunities and the ability to sort of work, do business with them is going to be in reducing the barriers to transactions, the barriers to doing business, the barriers to talking to each other. And this Asia-Pacific emergence is such an exciting story because this is where we are going to see the biggest changes coming through over the next 10, 20, 30 years. For me, this is probably one of the biggest and most important things when we're thinking about what's happening in terms of the payment sector. Now, this could apply pretty much to anything that relies on trust. And I think for any of these very important critical bits of infrastructure, you've got this tripod. And in any place, you're going to see some variation of this. You've got regulation that creates these foundation for many of these systems. You've got capacity and capability. And all of these things have to work together. But ultimately, what makes payment systems work is the ability to create trust in the network, the trust in the system that you are, your money is going to be looked after, that your transaction is going to be safe, and that there, will be, there won't be somebody who's double dipping in there. Now, that is exactly what happens when you go to parts of Asia where people are really fearful of making transactions because you just don't know what the systems are like in many cases. So when we think about how we're going to roll out and how we're going to take opportunities in many different parts of the world, we have to be conscious that in, not in every place will our capacity and capability be enough. Quite often, we will have to think about how do we create the right regulatory environment to be able to create a payment system that's different from what exists today. Because the way that you get credibility is to get the endorsement from government. And in other places, it's going to be very much around how do you create the credibility through better systems, faster payments, and more transparency, and more credibility. And this is where the whole sort of story about economics in networks becomes really, really difficult, but also really exciting, is that the driver is ultimately boiled down to trust. And trust is not something that you can fake. Trust is something that you have to build, and you have to invest in, and you have to build over a long period of time. So we've got these massive opportunities that are coming. And for me, the big, big issue for the payment sector is how are we going to take these opportunities going forward? So when I was thinking about this, so I was talking to Steve about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about how is it that we think about the payment system? And if we just slow down for a second, I think ultimately what we're talking about is an infrastructure that makes you, gives you the ability to do business in a different way. And I think that's really exciting because what we're talking about is a different way of transacting with each other, a much better way of transacting with each other. The real benefits that we get from, from, this in, in, from any of these kinds of infrastructure is very much around reducing the costs of doing business, around having these massive benefits of having networks, being able to scale, being able to fake this bigness that we don't necessarily have in places like New Zealand and many of the countries that we want to engage with in the Pacific and in parts of Asia. But also, ultimately, what are we talking about when we think about economic prosperity? Ultimately, what we're trying to unleash is significant amounts of innovation. And this innovation can only come once we take away the distractions of doing business, once we take away the inability to be, do business. For me, the outlook for the world, despite what's happening in the GFC, and we can talk about the doomsday stuff anytime. Uh, but the fact of the matter is when you strip away the cyclical stuff that's happening in terms of the credit crisis and all those kinds of things, ultimately the outlook for the global economy is incredibly positive. 
It's incredibly positive because of the ingenuity we keep on saying in terms of the way that we do business, in the types of business that we do. Um, you know, the innovation that we're seeing in the technology space is just one example, but we are going to see massive changes coming through over a very long period of time. And for me, the big changes that are coming ahead is exactly what should galvanize us to take action and to start changing the way that we do business. The first thing for me is this, this story about technology. What's happening in the technology space is completely revolutionizing our economy. We only have to look at the way that we do business, but more importantly, it's revolutionizing the way that we live our lives. And that means that we are going to see economic activity, economic prosperity opening up in places that we have never seen before. And this means that we are going to see this massive, massive shifts in new opportunities coming forward in the future. The aging story is one that's really underdone in terms of the massive impact it will have in terms of who we do business with. Our customers are going to look different. They're going to live in different places. And I think it's really important to think about our customers in many ways because you know, if I give you the example of New Zealand in terms of the implications of aging, it's so critical to see that because of an aging population, we are seeing population growth in entirely different places. In places like Gisborne, all the growth is coming in single-person households, and that means a whole bunch of lonely oldies, but, you know, it's, it's a sad reality of what is absolutely going on. But at the same time, it doesn't mean they're not a good customer base. They're just really different. And you can't just pretend that somehow because you service somebody who's over 65 10 years ago, the current 65-year-olds are going to be exactly the same. Each generation is so incredibly different that we've got this constantly moving target of what our customer base is. And because our customers' face is changing and the way that they're using technology, the way that they're purchasing things and what they're purchasing, it's making this moving target even harder to hit. And aging is going to be a really critical part because in advanced economies, it's going to create the uh, new economies. And in the emerging markets, we're going to get this incredible surge of economic activity and economic opportunity that is going to be unthinkable for most of us. The Asia Pacific region is exactly where the opportunities are in the future. If you look at what's going on in terms of this growth in the middle class families, there is only one place we can do business in. And the fact of the matter is, in many of these markets, the markets are still incredibly underdeveloped. And the infrastructure, whether you name it in terms of economic regulation, payment systems, or any other kinds of infrastructure, there is massive opportunities to improve. Now, it's easy to see something like this as a weakness, that's something that's going to hold them back. But for me, this is the opportunity of convergence. How do we lift this up? How can we be the ones in there doing the business, creating that opportunity for change? How are we going to unlock the innovation, the network benefits that exist in so many other places? And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is very much a story about one of opportunity. The payment system is in this incredibly exciting space where you create this incredible ability to unlock innovation and potential in the economy. But the thing is, the way of do doing things in the past will not necessarily be the right way of doing things in the future because we know that our customers are changing, the technology is changing, the economies and the markets that we want to operate in are changing. The opportunities that are coming are big, they are massive, but we won't be able to do them if we keep on doing what we have been doing in the past. I want to leave you with this particular quote, which I love, because I think it really sums up what it means to have a changing backdrop that's getting much faster. For me, this is exactly the embodiment of where we need to go next. Invincibility lies in the defense, the possibility of victory in the attack. We have to go forth, we have to change, and we have to take advantage of the opportunities we know are there, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Thanks, Shama. Well, we did a very good job of holding the crowd at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Um, have we got some <coughs> questions from the floor for Shamabil? He's a wealth of information, so hopefully there's somebody out there with their hand in the air. Tumbleweed moment. Tumbleweed, yeah. Because you're all from Wanganui? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Apparently, your uh, presentation answered... Everything. Everything. No, so we do. Just behind you, sir. I think it's an important point that you raise about... Um, the nature of older people changing. It, uh, it's the first time I think I've heard it um, where, you know, they're just not looked at as an amorphous mass that, um, you know, what you understand about a 65-year-old today is, 
is going to be what a 65 year old will be in, in 10 years time because you know we're all moving along that current so they'll they'll pick up a um, you know the technology and things that they have uh, up to a certain point and then you know we, we cease to be able to adapt and change but it's the first time I've heard that called out so thank you yeah I mean you know the example that I see is in my parents right so I gave them my iPad I thought you know they won't really be able to use it and within about a week they were fighting over who was going to use the iPad so I had to buy another one <laughs> and now, you know, they used to call up it for everything to get their business done, whatever it was, with the bank or whatever. Now they refuse to use the phone and everything has to be done by email. And they left telecom because they wouldn't deal with them over the, over the email. So they went to Orcon, who did. So, you know, this, this is some big changes that we're seeing. And my parents are in the older age group, so they're, they're not nearly as technologically advanced as baby boomers are. And baby boomers are going to be this incredible opportunity because they're healthier, they're working longer, and they're going to be spending a huge amount of money over the next little while. This is a big market that's coming, and I think we ignore it at our peril. Is that also an issue for advertisers? I know from the TV industry's perspective, they focus on 25, 54. If you're older than that, they don't really care about you. And I think that's a real mistake in ignoring this massive age group that's coming with a significant amount of disposable income. And I see, you know, we have, we have the TV industry and the advertising industry has for a very long time unfocused on the groups that thought had the money rather than the ones that actually had the money. And fortunately, baby boomers fit within that until very recently. But, you know, you see what's happening in the space of media in terms of advertising. They're really struggling because their uh, messages and their marketing is no longer relevant for the older age groups who are in a very different stage of their life. Um, you know, what we see in terms of the economics of, um, of, of aging is there are significant opportunities because we are going to see more of the economy being owned by these people, more of the spending being done by these people, but they're also going to be incredibly different from previous generations. And that creates a hell of a lot of new opportunities, but also a lot of risk because the current um, businesses that are aimed at the older populations, they are not the right ones to service the new oldies. Because of course all the 2554s have weighed down with too much debt, aren't they? Shall we well, with the 25, well, except for the ones that are renting like me. Uh, um, no, you're absolutely get him, get right. Get started on housing if you ever get the chance. <laughs> I think the, the issue with the 25 to 55 year olds, one, there is far fewer of them. So that's the age group that's shrinking in most parts of New Zealand, and they have far less disposable income. And I think what it means is that we're almost speaking to the wrong crowd, not the ones that have the incomes, not the ones who are, have the, uh, the discretionary spending. So we are, we're going to have to really rethink how we do things. And also the mindset is very different with the younger generations. As you know, they've got a much more social conscience in some ways, and you know, they're a little bit greeny, a little bit touchy-feely. Any, any other questions from the floor for Shamabil before we release them for the afternoon? Okay, thank you very much, Shamabil Yaka. Thanks for having me.